The Book of Acts tells the story of how a small band of spirit-filled, ordinary followers of Jesus changed the world with the hope of the gospel. The work that they began 2,000 years ago continues today, and it will continue until Jesus returns. We are Christ the King Church. For more information, visit ctksinci.com. All right, so... Um yeah, Jared and Nikki, I love you guys. We'll miss you. Um, and they'll need continued prayers because, as Kurt said, they are moving to Cleveland. Uh, so that is, that is uh, it's like Nineveh, really. I mean, uh, if we're being honest. <laughs> All right. Well, we're continuing our series in the book of Acts. The book of Acts tells about the origin story of the church and how the church uh, grew and expanded and it started in Jerusalem. And then it uh, had this handful of devoted Christians, but then it exploded worldwide over the last 2,000 years. And it's going to continue to advance to the ends of the earth. So every, uh, people from every uh, tribe, tongue, people uh, will be part of the kingdom of God. And that's part of the global extension of the gospel. And one of the key parts of the church's development is building a legacy. So every generation... Every generation of Christians needs to equip the next generation. And generation is the right word. It's a good word to describe this because discipleship is more than teaching. Discipleship is reproduction. Discipleship is is, uh, imparting one's life or imparting the life of Christ to another person. So the root of the word generation, gene or, or gene, that means to bring forth or to beget. And so if you're talking about generations of family, you're talking about how the family traits are passed down to the next generation. And so it's a word that describes this this passing on of what you possess. And so that's what true discipleship is like. True discipleship isn't merely imparting information. True discipleship is not just teaching, but it is reproducing the life of Christ in another person. So a church that reproduces then is going to need something. A church that's going to reproduce needs what any any person wants to reproduce. You need a family. You need a father and a mother. And so a church needs spiritual fathers and mothers to pass down the, uh, the family traits. They will bear fruit. Men and women coming together to bear fruit in ministry. And that's what we're going to look at today in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, let's dig in. Acts chapter 18, and we're going to see in... One chapter, four generations of Christians. Four generations of Christians here in one chapter. We'll start here in verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, He shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. This is God's word. Okay, so I think we should have a map. Do we have a map that we can put up? There it is. So we've... We're looking at the second missionary journey, and I've got my little laser clicker here. Exciting, isn't it? <laughs> so this, this, red, this red dot traces where they 
uh, where the missionary journey started. So here in Antioch, that's where it started. And then it went up around here, and God called them to go west, and they went up to Philippi. And then we went down this way into Athens. That's where we were last week. And so we're going to start in Athens, but what we're going to look at today, we're going to see three different cities that are connected. We see Athens, and then Corinth here, and then Ephesus over here. And so these three cities are going to occupy our attention this week and next week. So Acts 17, Paul was in Athens. This week, he's taking a trip, and he's over to Corinth. Now, if you're familiar with the New Testament, the book of 1st 2nd Corinthians tells us all about what happened in the city of Corinth. Now, up to this point, the different cities that Paul had visited were pretty short. They were cut short by persecution. Paul would go into a city. He would be persecuted by the Jews. They would run him out of town, and then he'd move on to the next city. That was the habit. Every week, that's the way it would go. It moved quickly from city to city. But in Corinth, something different happens. God appears to Paul in a vision right? When God appears to Paul in a vision and God says to him, don't be afraid. Press on because many people will believe in Christ here. I have many in this city who are mine and it's your job to bring in the harvest. And I want to keep you safe. So for the first time, Paul's going to be able to settle in for a while. And he ends up staying in Corinth for a year and a half. And he's able to establish a church. So no more this drive-by evangelism where he just kind of pops in and shares the gospel and people become Christians and he's got a role. He's going to be able to settle in and start a new church and be a father to them over a year and a half. And that brings us to this couple that we meet. We meet a couple named Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife. And uh, one of our residents, Daniel Kemp, said they're a boss couple. And I like the sound of that. They're a boss couple. So they're living in Corinth, and here in Corinth, they're running a family business. And their trade is tent making, which is convenient because that also happens to be Paul's trade. So uh, Paul lived with them, and he worked with them in this tent making trade. Now, this is a great setup, a great setup for uh, what the ministry is going to uh, come out of this arrangement. I mean, think about this. You have a Christian family that shares a trade with a single Christian man. And so they're going to open their home to him. They're going to give him a job. He's going to live with them. And they're going to, you know, just share the space. And he's going to train them for ministry because he is, after all, an apostle. So Christian family brings in a single man. They work together. They live together. And he trains them in ministry. That's life-on-life sort of discipleship. That's close quarters, close proximity. Paul discipled Aquila and Priscilla while working with them and while living with them. Now, there's something interesting about Aquila and Priscilla. It's subtle, but the subtle thing here is pretty significant. So their names, Aquila and Priscilla, appear in other books of the Bible. There's three times here in the book of Acts, and there's three other times in the New Testament. Their names appear in the book of Romans, in the book of 1 Corinthians, and the book of 2 Timothy. And they're always mentioned together. They're a boss couple, right? I mean, they do ministry together, and they're always mentioned together. So clearly, there was a significant ministry, husband and wife, laboring side by side for the gospel, with Paul as a spiritual father to them. Paul discipled both of them, invested in both of them, in home and at work, right? Now, in verse 1, we just read, Aquila, the husband, is mentioned first. But then in verse 18, and then later in verse 26, same chapter, um, and also in Romans and 1 Timothy, Priscilla's name is mentioned first. His wife, her name is mentioned first. So why would that be? Well, most likely it is because Priscilla was more prominent. She, uh, she was very well known in the early church, and there's a good chance that, I mean, she was, she's very talented. She's very skilled in ministry, um, and you know, maybe her husband was more reserved, but for whatever, whatever reason, like, she was more recognized as this very, very uh, strong and godly woman. And so she was a talented theologian. Now, they were valued as a couple, and Paul uh, uh, discipled them as a couple, but um, it seems as though Priscilla was more prominent. And so whenever Paul leaves Corinth, and then he heads over to Ephesus, now this happens a few verses later in this chapter, Paul takes Priscilla and Aquila with him. So they travel with him to Ephesus. 
And then sometime after that, Paul leaves Ephesus to go on to the next destination. But Paul leaves Priscilla and Aquila there in Ephesus. He trusted them enough to leave them behind and to continue in the work. Now just hold that in your mind and let's keep going. Verse 24. We'll skip down to verse 24. So now we're in Ephesus, okay? Last week was Athens. This week we're in, or we're just now we're in Corinth where Paul meets Priscilla and Aquila. They travel to Ephesus together. Paul leaves Ephesus. Priscilla and Aquila stay in Ephesus. Verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now let's pause there. So we're here in Ephesus now, and we meet this impressive guy. Apollos is an impressive new guy, and it says he's well-trained in Jewish theology. So he, he, he's, he's a very competent theologian. Verse 25, it says he was instructed or he uh, was competent in the scriptures. The, the Greek word there is katecheo, which that's where we get the word catechism, where you, you, learn, by, uh, you learn line by line, sentence by sentence. You, you, like a, a catechism that you would like have with your kids or something, you, you would read a question, a one-sentence question, and there's a one-sentence answer. One, one sentence question, one sentence answer. Line by line, repetitive catechesis. So that's, Apollos seemed to be instructed in that way, meaning it was very thorough, the type of learning that he had in the Bible. Now, Apollos is impressive. He's, he's preaching, he's speaking eloquently in the synagogue, he's um, debating, it seems, the Jewish leaders. But there was a problem. It seemed as though his theology needed some sharpening. There's, there's, something, there's something that's a little off with his theology. Verse 25 said he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. So he's not a heretic. It's not as though he's misleading or misrepresenting Christ. But it says that there was, there was a bit of an information gap. There's something he didn't know. And it says that they, though he knew only the baptism of John, so he has some problems with his theology regarding the baptism of John. What's that about? So give me a second here to, to lay this out. He's talking about John the Baptist, not the John who wrote the Gospel of John. John the Baptist. So the guy, he ate lo- locusts and honey and dressed up in camel hair and kind of a, kind of a wild man, you know. Um, that John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was Jesus' first cousin. And he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He appears in the New Testament, but he was mentioned at the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. So he's the last of the Old Testament prophets. And John's ministry uh, consisted of baptizing people. And it was called a baptism of repentance. And he baptized people in the Jordan River. And Jesus himself was baptized by John the Baptist, indicating that Jesus gave affirmation of John's ministry. But the baptism that John gave, this baptism of repentance in the Jordan River, it was not a Christian baptism. It was a baptism, uh, it was, you could think of it as a pre-Christian baptism. So, you know, uh, what we do now, if a person is baptized, they're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and they're baptized that represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, what John is doing is not that because Jesus had not even begun his ministry yet. So it was a, uh, I mean, a baptism would represent some sort of ceremonial washing, but it was not explicitly connected to the gospel event. It was something that preceded the, the gospel event of the death and resurrection of Christ. So it was a baptism, it's called a baptism of repentance. So John's ministry um, was like this. It, his ministry was to prepare the way for the Messiah. So he knew Jesus, he was his cousin, he's related to Jesus. So he knew Jesus, prepared the way for Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. His ministry came before Jesus' ministry. And the way, people, the way John prepared people for Jesus as the Messiah was calling them to repent of their sin. Now the, the means of forgiveness was yet to be revealed fully. 
but it was a calling to repent of the calling Jewish people to repent of their sins against God's covenant, meaning that, hey, we have not, as the Jewish people, kept the covenant the way God has called us to, which is why the ministry of Jesus is necessary, because nobody keeps God's covenant. Nobody follows Christ. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So John is kind of priming the pump, saying, hey, we're all sinners. We all need something. We're all fallen. We're broken. We are sinful, rebellious, wicked, right? That's what John is saying. He's, it's a baptism of repentance that is sort of tilling the soil, saying that we need something else. Now, here's a spoiler alert if you haven't read it. Uh, John the Baptist was beheaded uh, before Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, all right? So John never knew in his lifetime, he never knew the full revelation of the gospel. He never knew Jesus' death and resurrection, and he never knew the gift of the Holy Spirit, which would come at Pentecost. John never knew those things. So John's assessment of Jesus' life and ministry was accurate, but it was incomplete. Everything he knew was true, and everything that he taught was accurate. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, but he knew only the baptism of John, meaning that his knowledge of Jesus was somehow interrupted before the gospel, uh, the, the death and resurrection of Christ took place. So he died before the full picture was revealed. Now, after the resurrection of Jesus, John's baptism was no longer relevant because we're baptized into Christ, which includes, a, which includes repentance of sin. You with me? Whenever we're baptized as Christians... We don't need a baptism of John to say repent and then a baptism of Jesus which says we're forgiven now. The baptism of Jesus covers all of that. It is a fuller picture. John's baptism was a precursor and a preparation for. But now it's obsolete. John's baptism isn't necessary anymore. We need the, the baptism of Christ which says that we've repented of our sin. We die with Christ. We're raised with Christ which is we have new life in the resurrection. So John's baptism is irrelevant now. It doesn't have, any, um, doesn't have any purpose. Repentance is now coupled with faith in Christ. So in this way, John was the last Old Testament prophet. So he's pointing ahead towards the Messiah, but he never saw the fulfillment. He's anticipating the Messiah just like the Old Testament prophets did. Now here's another thing. John had lots of followers. There were lots of people that would come from far and wide to, to uh, benefit from his ministry, hear his teaching, and to be baptized. Because there were people, there was a, there was a hunger for the Messiah, and there was a, a recognition that we need to repent of our sin, that we have not kept covenant with God. And so John had a large following. So people would come and see him, to be baptized by him, and then they wouldn't stay in Jerusalem and hear about the God, and they went on their way. So there were a lot of people who were baptized by John, who saw the need to repent, who have even heard of Jesus because John anticipated Jesus, but they didn't know what Jesus did. So there was, uh, these people would believe that the Jews needed to repent of breaking the covenant. They believe in Jesus as the Messiah, but they don't know where it ended. They don't know how it all worked out. They don't know the death and resurrection of Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So these are special kind of Jews. Jews that are faithful with what they knew. They're, they're pre-Christians. They're, they're ready to become Christians. They just don't have the information yet to complete it. So they don't know enough, but what they do know, they believed it. And they, so they had faith. And Apollos is one of these kind of Jews. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, but he only knows the baptism of John. So he's not quite Christian yet. But not because he lacks faith, but because he lacks knowledge. He needs to be instructed. He needs to learn exactly what happened. What, how did that thing with Jesus turn out? You know, John the Baptist spoke highly of him. Uh, he's the Messiah, so I'm, I'm with you on that. But he didn't, know, he didn't know what happened. And that's where Priscilla and Aquila come in. They hear Apollos' bold, powerful teaching in the synagogue, but they recognize his spiritual firmware needs an upgrade because there's some stuff that he doesn't know yet. So this is an important ministry, and I think it's something that just in our day we can get, a, get some application out of this. There are a lot of people who are similar to Apollos, and that there's, they're favorably disposed toward Christianity and to Jesus. They might even say that they're Christian, but maybe they're culturally Christian. 
There's a lot of people that are like this. They believe in Christ, but they lack knowledge. So you may know people like this. We, I'm, we all do. And so I, know, I know a lot of people that would claim to be Christian, but there's, it, it, it's, more of a, it's more of a cultural thing. And it's not that they've rejected Christ and they, don't, they want nothing to do with him. They just want the culture. It's like, no, they, they're really favorable to Jesus, but they've never heard the gospel. They've never actually heard the gospel. And some of you, that's your testimony. You came into this church thinking, well, there's a church. I want to go to this one. And then you hear the gospel and you realize, well, wait a minute. I've never heard this before. I've never actually heard the gospel before. And when you hear the gospel, you're like Apollos. It's like you, you, had, you had faith but insufficient knowledge. And so whenever you hear more knowledge, then your faith latches on to that. And then you're able to, you're, you're able to follow Christ um, accurately. You're, you're able to, to become a full follower of Jesus. So there's a lot of people that I think are like this, especially as cultural Christianity is on the wane. There's still a lot of people who are, um, who are in this position to where they believe in Jesus in a cultural sense, but they need to hear the gospel to be able to put all the pieces together for them to be, to be fully uh, Christian. So as we're about to see, Aquila and Priscilla, that's what they do for Apollos. They're going to become a spiritual father and mother to him. They're going to invest in him, and they're going to teach him after taking initiative with him. All right, so verse 26 tells us how this went down. Verse 26, it says, He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, referring to Apollos, but when Priscilla and Aquila, there's her name first, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now let's stop there. So Apollos is like John the Baptist. He believed in Christ as the Messiah. He believed in repentance, but he did not know the resurrection. He did not know the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so at this point, the resurrection of Jesus happened about 15 years prior. But it's not like we have CNN. There's no way to know unless word travels by word of mouth. They didn't even have Bibles published then because the Bible is still in the midst of being written in, the, in terms of the New Testament witnesses. So, so there has to be this word of mouth transmission and word travels slow. You, everything happens slow by our standards in that time. So whenever Priscilla and Aquila hear his teaching, they recognize there's a problem. He has faith, but he lacks knowledge. And Paul wasn't there. Paul's already moved on. Paul wasn't there to correct Apollos. You know, it'd be nice having this expert Christian apostle hanging around with you whenever you get into a debate with somebody. It's like, well, uh, I actually don't know the answer to that, but this guy does. You know, it's like that. But Paul, Paul wasn't there anymore. But Priscilla and Aquila, they were there. Paul had equipped them. God had put them there, so they obeyed, and they talked to Apollos. Now, can you imagine how that conversation would have went with Apollos? I mean, Apollos believes in Jesus, believes that Jesus is the Messiah, but doesn't know whatever happened with him. I can imagine just them saying, like, you know, hey, Apollos, um, do you not know what actually happened with Jesus? Have, have you not heard what, what actually went down? And Paul's like, you know, what are you talking about? They're like, well, all right, some bad news, you know, so just chill for a second. Bad news here. Um, the Romans and the Jews conspired and killed him. And he's like, he would freak out. It's like, no way, man, that, that can't be. How is this possible? Yeah, I, I, he's the Messiah. How could he be dead? I don't get that at all. They're like, hold on, hold on, chill. You know, wait a minute, I'll let us finish. He was dead for three days. They buried him, but he rose again on the third day. So he's risen. Jesus now has risen from the dead, and now he is seated at the right hand of God Almighty, and he has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit is available uh, to, to everyone who believes in Christ. And not only that, but hold, hold it now, brace yourself, Gentiles are becoming Christians. And they're receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit too. Now that's really going to floor it. But, but not only that, now hold on, there's, one, there's more. We're supposed to preach the gospel to Gentiles and this message is going to go global. So the kingdom of God is here and it is advancing through the church to, ev to the ends of the earth. I mean, imagine what that would be like for it to hit you after 15 years of believing in Jesus as the Messiah and preaching even that Jesus is the Messiah, proving it from the scriptures in the Old Testament, then this couple comes along and they say, hey, get a load of this. You're not going to believe what just happened. That's what it was like for Apollos. Now, some of you may be wondering specifically about Priscilla 
and her role in, in this conversation. So verse 26 says that when Aquila and Priscilla explain theology to Apollos, her name is the one that's mentioned first. And that's, that's a subtle way of, by Luke, the author of the book, to indicate that she knew her stuff. And very likely she was the one that really um, had the theological acumen to be able to explain this. So most likely, she, I would imagine she did the talking. So I think what is, what is fairly evident from the text is that she is gifted. She is trusted. She's trained. She hung out with Paul for a year and a half. And Luke emphasizes her role and her prominence by placing her name first, which would have been against custom. So now what happens is, is a lot of Christians will take this text or this story and they'll turn Priscilla into some first century megachurch preacher as though she's like, you know, Joyce Meyer of, you know, early Corinth or something, you know. They, they, they kind of blow us up to make, it, to make it say something that it doesn't say. So the question that, that I want us to take a moment, because we've wrestled with this as a church, I want to take a moment and just, and just address the question, does Priscilla's role here contradict the other scriptures about how men and women are supposed to relate to one another in the church? So uh, I'll give you two verses that I'm referring to, um, speaking about how um, the role of men and their leadership in the church. So 1 Timothy 2.12 this is from Paul. He says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Now, don't freak out. It's a freak out verse. Don't freak out. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Here's the second one. Um, this is about, um, I don't know, four or five verses later, but in the next chapter. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, Therefore, an overseer, now it means elder or pastor, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. And then it goes on from there to describe the, uh, the qualifications, but there at the head of the list uh, is that it's a, it's a man who is, um, yeah, so it's, it's going to be a man, not necessarily a married man, but um, the male role is, is clearly indicated there. So take these two together, and First Timothy is saying, uh, God restricts the office of elder to qualified men, and God also restricts the function of elders to qualified men. So when he's talking about the office, he says an elder or an overseer must be a husband of one wife, and he goes on to describe the qualifications of a man who is called to be an elder. Prior, when he's describing the function, he's saying that he does not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. So there's an indication there that um, he wants men to be taking the lead, men to be the ones that are exercising the authority in the church. So now, is that what we see Priscilla doing here? Is she, is she violating that scripture? Is she either acting as an elder or trying to be an elder? Is she exercising authority in some way? No, I don't, not at all. We don't see any indication that she's doing that. In fact, what she's doing here is very appropriate, and that's really what, the, that's the takeaway that I want to emphasize to you this morning. I want to emphasize what she does as a good thing and how we can, uh, we can follow her example. And like women, how you in the church can, can see Priscilla as an example to follow because what she does here is very good. The reason why it's not an exercise of authority is because this is a private conversation. She, at verse 26, said that they took him aside. So it's not as though Apollos was preaching in the synagogue Priscilla and Aquila were there in the pew getting all worked up, and finally she couldn't take it anymore. She stands up and says, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You're wrong. She's not doing so in this authoritative way, drawing attention to herself, being, uh, being disruptive. No, they, they waited until afterwards. And it says afterwards they took him aside. And in fact, it's interesting, the, the, the way that the language works there in verse 26, the NIV translates it that they took him into their home. So that's, that's, a, that's an interpretive decision on the part of the NIV, but it's interesting that they see the, the Greek language construction to indicate a, this is a conversation in their home even. So Priscilla was not teaching in the church. She was not preaching in the church or in the synagogue. They're having a private conversation, maybe in the church parking lot or maybe in the home, but it's, it's certainly not part of the formal teaching of the church. So... The Bible's restriction here, the Bible's restriction on women teaching is not a matter of passing information, but it is a matter of authority. And that's where the restriction is. So God's design 
is for godly men to assume responsibility for the church. And God holds the men accountable. God, the elders of the church. God holds the elders accountable. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Submit to the elders because they're the ones who are going to have to give an account. So on the day of judgment, there will be an accounting given for this congregation that I and the other pastors will give that the rest of you will not give. There is a responsibility that we've taken on, this burden of, of leading this church and all of the good and the bad that comes with it, and we'll answer to God for it in a way that everybody else won't. So there is a particular responsibility here, and that's a good thing. So it's, our, it's a responsibility of the elders that are called by God. The church affirms that. It's their responsibility to lead it. That's good for us. And so the authority in the church is primarily exercised in its teaching ministry. So what I'm doing right now is the most visible and significant exercise of authority in the church. It is the proclamation of God's word, the teaching of the church, but it is, it is done in this venue. So it is, we're gathered here for worship, and I'm not up here giving a speech, right? I mean, like, presumably, if I've been faithful and if I've done my work well, I'm not just speaking opinions, but I'm telling you what God says. And, and I know that this is true whenever, because I've talked to people about this, I know that that's the way it is heard and received. And so that's a very sober thing that I take very seriously. And all the preachers do, we take this very seriously because we know that when we're saying something, we're not just saying, hey, here's what I think. But we're saying, okay, what does the Bible say? Because we believe that's what God says and communicating what God says through this venue. And so we're, we're communicating God's word and that is an authoritative thing. Our, there's an authority in the office and an authority uh, of the function of teaching. So in this gathered worship, there is a transaction here where God is present. The angels are present. We worship. We take the, the bread and the cup. We, we, we follow a liturgy. We proclaim God's word. There is a, there's a communication of God to us here, and that's an authoritative thing. So that's how the church's, primar- the church's authority is primarily exercised. Not the only way, but that's the main way. Now, the Bible does not say that a woman cannot teach a man in general, Right? Or that a man cannot learn from a woman in general. Because if that were the case, we wouldn't be able to have conversations. We wouldn't even be able to speak to each other. Because what if a woman knows something that I don't know? Say, well, I don't say anything because I might learn something, which means you'd be teaching me, which means you're exercising authority. Therefore, you should not do that. You should be silent. That's not what the Bible says. We, we have to be able to interact. We have to be able to talk to one another. But there is a, there is a certain venue where the authority is more prominent, more present. So we couldn't function as a family of God if that's what Paul is restricting, saying men or women cannot teach a man. There's a, what Paul is saying is teaching or exercising authority. He's, he's referring to a type of teaching that is packed with the authority of the church. So, so it would be inappropriate for a woman to preach here and to say, I'm speaking on behalf of the church and with the church's authority. That doesn't mean a woman is lesser. It just means that there's, that's not the role that God has designed for women. That's a, result, a role that God has designed for qualified men to, to occupy. So a healthy church family then will have men and win, women working together all the time in various capacities, you know, praying together, talking with one another, studying the scriptures together, challenging one another, rebuking one another. Let me just tell you as a testimony, I have been rebuked by many a woman in this church. <laughs> And, it was, and it's not inappropriate for that to happen. It, it, is, it, is, it is good for that to happen because we all have the Spirit of God. It's the priesthood of all believers. We interact with each other. And so, women, like, I, I, think the, I think because of our theology, there is a, maybe the women are a little more timid than you need to be. Um, so, it's, I mean, I w- went to encourage women. It's like, hey, we want to speak into each other's lives. And it goes both ways. So men and women challenging one another. So there, we need to be able to have this sort of transaction because if men only rebuke men and women only rebuke women or correct one another, teach one another, then what we lack is the perspective that we offer each other, right? Now, that doesn't mean that we're interchangeable and that every office and every role and everything uh, should be exactly the same. Not, not, not at all. But it does mean that we benefit from one another and God has ordered it in a certain way that is for the good of the church. So the Bible does say that the teaching ministry will be done in a particular way by qualified men, and God holds the elders responsible for that. So 
just if, if, for those of you who may not be familiar, the elders have done a good bit of work on this this year. And if you want to, to read our position paper, um, we, got, we have a link on our website. Just go to ctkcincy.com slash sexuality. ctkcincy.com slash sexuality. It's not on the public, but sexuality. And we've got our position paper on that. Um, and it, it lays it out in more, in more detail. So when Priscilla and Aquila correct Apollos, they are not exerting authority or power over him or teaching in a way that is inappropriate. They're sharing the gospel with him. It's a conversation with influence, not a teaching with authority. And Priscilla and Aquila are great examples of men and women acting as spiritual mothers and fathers. As, as somebody who is like, hey, here's, here's a man that needs, who needs equipping. Here's a, here's a guy who has a lot of potential. Priscilla presumably had, you know, she had superior knowledge to her husband, at least was more articulate in explaining it. And she wasn't there would have been no reason why she would not have shared that with them within the right context. And that's exactly what they did. They're Christian mother and father reproducing, multiplying in the life of a Christian brother. I say Christian brother, that may be, I don't know exactly what his spiritual state is. So of, of, a, of a man who became a Christian brother, we'll leave it at that. Okay, so that, I say all this because I want, to, I, want to, I want to address something that's been a question in our church, but also to promote this, this idea of a family. So I mean, we, that's one of our core identities. We're a family as a church. What means we have, we need spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers working together to reproduce. That's, that is the great commission. It is, is uh, making disciples is reproduction. It is not merely um, just imparting information. There's brothers and sisters also working together to harvest souls. Let me give you two scriptures that speak in this language. You see where this is coming from. The first one is Galatians 4.19. It's an odd metaphor, but, but you'll see what I'm talking about. Galatians 4.19, the Apostle Paul says, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. So Paul is saying, like, you're my spiritual children, but he's frustrated with them because they're regressing in their growth. So it's almost like you guys need to be born again again. You know? It's like I'm in the anguish of childbirth because I want to see Christ formed in you, but there's, a, there's barriers in their thinking. But he's speaking as a father, or in this case, uh, more motherly. But he's speaking as somebody who's trying to reproduce with these, with these Christians. Um, the next example is uh, 1 Corinthians 4.15. Now, now we're talking to the Corinthians. And so this is, this is where uh, Paul and Priscilla and Aquila, they had a significant ministry together at the beginning. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, Paul says, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Meaning there's, there's lots, of, lots of stuff out there, a lot of people that will teach you information, that want to impart data to you, but you don't have a lot of people that are really investing in you. He's, he's defending his ministry there, saying, I've been a father to you. I've invested in you personally. So he's describing the most mature version of Christian discipleship. So the difference between a guide and a father is a, a guide just can just give information. So a blog post can be a guide. A podcast can be a guide. These things can point you in a direction. But what Paul is saying is that what we need is spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. And it takes a, Christian, a mature Christian man or woman to re reproduce the life of Christ in you. So in our church, we need both of these. We need spiritual fathers. We need spiritual mothers. So uh, College Connect, that's, uh, that's been mentioned earlier, is something we do where, um, started by Emily Creamer and Kenzie Wall, where they paired up um, college students with other members of the church, sometimes families, sometimes uh, singles or whatever. And... It's, it's merely a place for the college students to be able to connect with other Christians in the body. And, I mean, maybe it'll start out as a place to do laundry and eat, meal, eat a meal or something. But the hope is that it would mature into a formative relationship to where there can be some discipleship going on, some spiritual mothering and spiritual fathering taking place um, in these, these relationships that, that come together. That's a good thing. So in a Christian marriage between a husband and wife, when they come together, they become a father and a mother, and they reproduce. And that's, that's the same thing that happens in the church. We work together, and there's a harvest of souls. New life is formed. You know, Laura mentioned earlier, uh, Laura Reynolds, about the women's retreat. 
And this woman, um, is it Jane Armstrong, is that her name? Is that right? Jane Armstrong? Yes. yes thank you, Ashley. Uh, <laughs> um, Jane Armstrong, she, so she was on staff, uh, or she'd been on staff at Campus Crusade for, I think, 40-some years. So 45 years, more or less. She's been a spiritual mother, and to my knowledge, she's, she's not a married woman. And so she's dedicated herself fully to making disciples, to being a mother to young college student men and women. Because, I mean, a lot of, I mean, we, we need mentors. We need people that we can look up to and that invest in us. And we also need to be passing that down to others. And over time, we saw this, I mean, 45 years is significant. And because she was so devoted to it, you see this, this huge family of brothers and sisters in Christ that have been mothered by her and multiple generations to where it's not just her direct influence, but she influences somebody who influences somebody and so on and so on and so on, many generations down. That's, that's the sort of thing that we want to be able to, to, to see happen more and more among our own church. And my wife and I, we do um, premarital counseling together. And uh, I don't always get to do it that way, but whenever we get to do it together, it's, it's so much better. I mean, I really do enjoy it because Laura is a really good listener. She asks good questions, and we're able to compare notes. Um, a lot of times, I, she'll ask questions, and it just enables me to think and observe without having to also try to drive a conversation and, and you know, make sure I'm kind of managing interactions. And then whenever we're able to, uh, whenever we're able to talk later, we'll, we'll be able to um, compare observations and and, and try to understand better the couple that we're talking with so we can be more helpful. I mean, that's man and woman working together side by side with each other to help, to help benefit someone. We're wanting to not merely say, okay, here's, here's the data dump on marriage wisdom. <laughs> we, we never do that. But it's like, here's, we want to invest in you uh, for at least a few conversations enough to hopefully impart something to you that will further form Christ in your life which, if that's what happens, then that will contribute to a healthy marriage. All right, so let's see what happened to Paul, Apollos quick. I know we're, we're getting towards the end here. Let's just see the last couple of verses here in this section. Verse 27. So he's speaking of Apollos. When he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Now, it is noteworthy that Apollos did have a more public ministry, and uh, that public ministry is one of rebuking and friction, conflict even, and that's, that's something that is appropriate for a man to do as he's exercising authority. Um, but he greatly helped people. You see that there is a because of the influence of Priscilla and Aquila in his life. His life is enriched. He's, he's, he's uh, certainly, if he wasn't a, a full Christian before, he's definitely a saved believer now. And he's able to pass down this legacy of faith such that he is helping other people and training other people and defending the faith. So whenever Apollos left Corinth, he left a legacy there. There's a significant ministry that is named all over 1 Corinthians. And you see Apollos' name, Paul says, you know, I watered, or I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase, right? I mean, it's like, there's, his name is prominently featured as a powerhouse in this church. And so here in Acts 18, um, we see four generations of Christian discipleship. You see the Apostle Paul, who's a spiritual father, and Priscilla and Aquila, who benefited from his ministry, trained them. And then you see Priscilla and Aquila train Apollos, Who's the third generation from Paul. And then you see the people that benefited from Apollos' ministry as he went on and had a, a ministry in Corinth. Four generations of passing down the legacy of faith. And you see the same idea in 2 Timothy 2.2 2, where Paul says, same thing, here's four generations in this one verse. And what you have heard me, or what you have heard from me, there's first generation, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to you, uh, faithful men, so there's you and me, there's two, and then entrust to faithful men, that's third generation, who will be able to teach others also, four generations. So it's 
taught directly, and it's also modeled here in the Scripture. So what can you do with this? Some of you um, may be mothers and fathers yourselves uh, with your own physical children. Um, you can be mothers and fathers by inviting others, like Priscilla and Aquila did, into, into your home and investing in people within the family context. You can do workplace ministry where you can maybe disciple people that are Christians in your workplace or share the gospel with people in your workplace. These are ways to be a, a father or mother to people. Some of you may think that you don't have much to offer, right? You may think that there's not, you haven't been to seminary, you don't know all the Christian things, you don't know all the theology stuff. But the thing is, like, there's, there, passing down our faith does not require us to be, you know, theologically, um, you know, seminary level trained. We can invest in other people and be faithful with what we have and trust God to give us more. You know, the, the scripture in Luke about to, uh, you know, if you're faithful with much, God will give you more. Or if you're faithful with small things, God will give you more things. Being faithful with those small things, God, you can trust God to give you more opportunities. So be faithful with what God has given you. We could all be better at what we do. We could all have more knowledge, more training, but God uses us where we are with what we have. And so just as a point of application, you know, think about maybe who there is in your life that you could be intentional with. And, and instead of saying it as, yeah, I need somebody to be a spiritual father or mother to me, I mean, you, that, that's less within your control. But what you can control is who you might be a spiritual father or mother to, who you might be able to invest in. So don't let Satan lie to you and say, well, you're not smart enough or you don't have enough experience or there's too much sin in your past or whatever. It's like, let God use you where you are. And if you want a place to go to meditate on this, go to 1 Corinthians 12 and just meditate on the, the body metaphor that, that is presented there in 1 Corinthians 12. And we see like, you know, you might think, I wish I was a hand, but you're a foot instead or something. Um, let God use you where you are with what you have and be faithful with it. So no matter what your weaknesses are, how ignorant you are, be faithful with what God has given you and take on this calling to be a mother and a father in Christ. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus, we, we are grateful for the, the blood that was shed on our behalf that has made us a made us reconciled to you and brought us into relationship to where we're not strangers and aliens and cut off from you, but we're brought near and we are your children and you are our heavenly father and you've called us to be fathers and mothers in Christ to those um, that you put in our sphere of influence. So we ask you, God, for the strength and the wisdom to be able to step out of faith and to do that for one another. Help us, God, to grow and to, to take the initiative and to not be timid, to not hold back, but um, to be bold in our faith, to be bold in our, um, in our desire to, to help others to see Christ formed in them. So I pray, God, for a heart of a father, a heart of a mother, and that we will take up this calling as a church. And we thank you, God, for uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit that has empowered us and that you've given us to be able to um, be faithful in whatever you've called us. We know that we don't lack anything. To wh Whatever you've called us to, you've given us the ability to follow through by your Spirit. So help us, God, to walk in that power and faith. And we ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are Christ the King Church. For more information, visit ctkcincy.com.